mean we are prisoners here? Yeah. In effect, yes, you are. Unless you care to think again about cooperation. We've thought about it, and the answer's no. Very well. Then you'll have to stay here. When 738 arrives, I'll have you transferred to it. And then what? You'll be taken back to Mars. Maybe a few years in one of the factories down there will make you wish you changed your mind. Oh, no. Is the great hall. I'll scan the place from end to end. Now, Jeff, what's the point? We've covered the whole route between here and the sleeping quarters a dozen times. Well, once more can't hurt. Well, nothing. You want a close up of the foot of the staircase? Yes, please. Well, there it is. In darkness, just as before. Well, then they can't be up there. Paddy distinctly told us if anybody used the stairway, the light would automatically come on. But once they reached the room, it'd go out. Only if they closed the door behind them. And Lemmy and Mitch wouldn't have done that. They didn't intend to remain longer than a few moments that it would take to collect the bed and head back here again. Well, what could have happened to them? Well, they could have got lost. Paddy said that from here, the way to the sleeping quarters was rather complicated. But he gave them the fullest directions. And if they did miss their way, all they had to do was turn around and come back. They must have been gone for at least two hours now. And if we go and search for them and they return, meanwhile? Well, one of us will have to stay here. You'd better, Frank. Uh, you and I will go, Doc. Very well, if you say so. Try to follow us on that vision phone, will you? Well, I tried to follow Lemmy and Mitch, but it doesn't seem to receive all the places it did before. Well, well do your best, just the same. Of course, but find them soon. I, I'd hate you and Doc to get lost as well. If Paddy was right, it shouldn't be possible to get lost. He controlled only part of the ship, and he said it was almost impossible to pass from one section to another without the Martian's permission. Well, let's hope he's right. Uh, come along then, Doc. Look, hadn't we better try the other door? Why? Nothing happened the last time we tried it. Well, it's the quicker way, and it might be working. Oh, very well. No, nope. still out of action. We'll have to go the other way. Come on. The directions Paddy had given Mitch and Lemmy, and which Jet and I now followed, seemed simple enough. But we soon found them to be totally inadequate, and it wasn't long before we were lost in a maze of corridors. We could well understand now why Mitch and Lemmy had not found their way back to the room in which we had first found ourselves awake. There was no word from Frank, so we could only assume that the vision phone of the control panel, where we hoped he was still sitting, was incapable of being tuned to whatever part of the asteroid Jet and I were now unwillingly exploring. We were in a long, winding, well-lit corridor, similar to the one where we had first heard the voice of the Martian. It was so similar that, for a while, we both thought we knew where we were. But, as we progressed, and no warning voice told us to turn back, we soon realized we were mistaken. Hold it, Doc. Oh, this can't be the way. There should be a set of those spiral steps leading out of here. Should have been on the right, about 50 yards after coming down that slope. That's if Paddy's instructions were correct. Well, I doubt if they are. Yeah, so do I. Well, maybe we'd better go back to that big junction. Where the four corridors meet? Yeah. Well, Paddy said it would be three. Well, that was the only junction we've seen up to now, and it was four, all identical in appearance. Well, let's go back there. We'll take another way this time. Come on. Say, this is the place, isn't it? Uh, the junction, I mean. I would have thought so, but there are only three corridors here. But... Couldn't have got lost in that short distance. Unless we took a wrong turning on the way back. I wouldn't have thought so. Well, there are certainly only three corridors meeting here. They couldn't have rebuilt them since we were here last. Uh, perhaps we'd better retrace our steps again. There was only some way of marking the way we'd come. We don't even possess a pencil between us. Oh, a large ball of string would be even more useful. Well, what are you doing? Uh, seeing if I can make a mark on the wall with my boot. Well? Nope. Goodness knows what that wall can be made of. I can't make even a scratch on it. 
This could be the three corridors that Patty meant, I suppose. The ones we should have passed originally. In which case, assuming we came down that one, we should take the center of the three passageways facing it. Right, let's do that. Come on, then. But we were still no better off. The stairs we had hoped to find did not appear. The corridor forked twice in a very short time, and then again assumed a circular course, but in the opposite direction to the one from which we had just retreated. And then we heard a sound that made us instinctively flatten ourselves against the wall. Not that doing that helped us much, but there was no openings of any kind in which we could have hidden. What do you make of that, Doc? Sounds like a, a drum or a piece of machinery. No, it's, it's marching feet. What? Well, isn't it? Yes, I think it is. Not far off, either. Should we retreat, do you think? About a hundred yards back, there was a flight of stairs. Maybe we could hide there. Uh, no point. Here they are. Just coming around the corner now. Yes. Condition types. Look at them. Like men sleepwalking, looking straight ahead, neither to right nor left. Mm. Doesn't seem to be anybody in charge of them. I wonder where they're going. When they get level with us, we'll find out. Well, how? You'll see. They're nearly level with us now. I'll approach the one on this side of the front rank. Stop. There. See what I mean, Doc? What are your orders? Where are you going? To Sphere Bay Number 5. What for? It must be made ready to receive the sphere from asteroid 738. And that's the one that's on its way here. When is 738 due to arrive? I do not know. Well, who'll be in that sphere when it does get here? I do not know. Well, who told you to get the bay ready? Orders were received and orders must be obeyed without question at all times. <laughs> I've heard that before somewhere. But don't you know who gave you the orders? Orders must be obeyed yes, without... Yes, 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 we know all about hey, that. Hey, hey, Jet, just a minute. Yeah? That bay Mitch saw on the vision phone, the one with the huge sphere in it. Well? Well, according to him, it was built into a crater up on the asteroid's surface. So? And if those men are going to the bay, they'll have to go outside where there's no atmosphere. But all they're wearing are their, their crew suits. They, they couldn't go outside in those. Yes, then they must collect some kind of space suit first. Well, what if they do? Oh, don't you see? Look, we've been without helmets ever since we came aboard this ship. Why were they taken from us? To prevent our going outside. What other reason could there be? But why try to prevent it? We couldn't do any harm just walking around on the surface. No. There can only be one reason. They wanted to be sure we wouldn't wander into one of the sphere bays. Because if we did, we might well board one of those spheres and make off with it. They're easy enough to control, as Lemmy and I found out when we escaped from that flying doctor. And if these men are going outside, they'll need suits, of course. Of course. Come on, let's follow them. We may find where the suits are stored and find our helmets among them. All right, Doc, we're falling behind. Now, you... What are your orders? You will proceed to Bay 5 and carry out the orders already given to you. Orders received and understood. All right, Doc. Come on. Let's see what a little conducted tour brings forth. Jed and I walked alongside the group of men. We passed through at least a mile of corridors, occasionally climbing flights of steps and walking up slopes which brought us nearer and nearer the asteroid surface. At last, we came to a huge, circular door. Without hesitation, the man Jet had spoken to approached it and pressed the control. Immediately, there came the now familiar, rasping sound of the warning for all doors in our section of the asteroid to be closed. A few moments later, the door opened to reveal a great hall similar to the one we had passed through when we first left the room in which we had been confined. The difference between this hall and the other was that instead of a corridor being at the far end of it, there was another airtight door, similar to the one we were now passing through. There was also a number of smaller doors set in the side wall. The first door closed behind us. Then the men split up into fours and made for some of the smaller doors. Jet and I followed the men who had been at the rear of the column. When the door for which they were heading was reached, one of the men opened it. He and his three companions went inside. Jet and I followed, then stopped in surprise at the sight that met our eyes. <laughs> Oh. 
Come on, Doc. Let's get inside before that door closes and locks us out. This must be a storeroom for spacesuits. Do you think our helmets are up here? Well, I don't hope we're ever finding them if they are. It'd take us hours to explore this place. Hey, wait a minute. Those conditioned fellows, they're taking four of those suits to pieces. Yes, they're going to put them on. We'll do the same. And go outside. Well, why not? Nobody should recognize us in these get-ups, and we may learn quite a lot that will help us to get away. Well, I'd rather find out how to locate Mitch and Lemmy, but okay, what you say goes, Jed. I'm with you. And let's hurry up or those fellows will be out of here before we're even dressed. Now, keep a close watch on them. Put every piece on in the same order as they do. You bet. Well, so far, so good. Yeah, they're putting their helmets on now. Okay, watch how they do it. We'll put ours on, too. Right, here goes. This suit feels so stiff. It's like being enclosed in a suit of armor. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, quite clearly. These suits must carry radio. But where? And where does the oxygen supply come from? And... What do we do if it runs out? Well, it must last as long as it'll take those fellas to do whatever they have to do outside. And they're going. Uh, fall in behind and stay close to them. Right. And even more important, stay close to each other. Attention! Attention! The Martian. It sounds as though his voice is right here inside my suit. All personnel are to circle at the Spear Bay airlock immediately. Well, that includes us, Doc. Come on. We'll join the end of the main column. Exhausting the air out of here before opening the outer door. This is when we find out if we put those suits on properly. The airlock is now exhausted and outer door about to open. And these suits must be okay. Thank goodness for that. And there goes the outer door. All personnel will proceed to their bunk and carry out the orders as instructed. On completion of tasks, you will return to the airlock. That is all. Here we go, Doc. Come on. It is a crater with dozens of spheres parked on its floor. Yes, and room for dozens more. Look, there's the big one that Mitch told us about. Uh, it could be. Stick close to the working party, Doc. We should get a good chance to look this place over. Stick close to them, you say? They're splitting up and going in different directions. Oh. Well, what do we do? Follow just one of them? No the point in that. We'll go our own way. Huh? Now, not too far. Just up to that big ship. I want to get a really close look at it. smaller spheres. Not from the outside, anyway. Well, do you think it's operated in the same way? Probably. In that case, we should be able to get inside merely by pressing this control. Well, we certainly can. Anybody watching us? Not that I can see. Very well, let's get inside, right? The construction of this sphere seems to be exactly the same as the smaller one. And the control panels are identical, too. Which means it needs only a few men to operate it. Yeah, but how about navigating the thing? How about food and water? And, always assuming we get this ship off the ground, where do we head for? For Mars and the Discovery. At least we can contact Earth from there. If Control is still listening, they may have given us up as lost. Well, we've seen all we need to down here. Let's get up to the next deck, see what's up there. Um, open the door into the central pillar. Right. The stairs leading up should be behind it. Contact. stocked with food and water, and seems to work on exactly the same principle as the smaller spheres. Mm. Well, I think we've seen enough for now. Let's hope Frank was taught to be a crew man on a ship like this, as Paddy says he was. If so, the mere sight of that control room downstairs should bring back to his mind all the training he received when he was conditioned. Yeah. Operating it should then be simplicity itself. It should be, yes. Well, let's get outside again, see what those conditioned times are up to. I can't see anyone. Well, let's get back to the airlock. Maybe we'll catch sight of them from there. Right. I wonder when that sphere from 738 is due to arrive. Do you think we might see it land? Well, I'm rather hoping we will. It must be fairly close now. Jet! Yes, Doc? The door leading inside the asteroid. It's closed. Good grief, so it is. Come on. Take it easy. Don't run too hard, Jet. Jet! Is it closed? Tight? Yes, Doc. We can't open it. It's remote controlled. We're stuck. 
rocks stuck out here on the asteroid's surface. That was episode 14 of Journey into Space. Taking part in this recording were Andrew Foles as Jet Morgan, Alfie Bass as Lemmy, Guy Kingsley Pointer as Doc, and Don Sharp as Mitch. Others taking part were David Jacobs and Alan Tilton. The orchestra was conducted by Van Phillips, who also composed the music. Journey into Space was written and produced for the BBC by Charles Chilton. The BBC presents Jet Morgan in The World in Peril. Jet and the crew of the Discovery are aboard the Martian asteroid 734. Paddy Flynn, who so Jet gathered, had been a prisoner of the Martians for a hundred years, mysteriously disappeared after telling Jet that he intended to lead a rebellion against the Martians. Fearing that some harm might have befallen Paddy, Jet decided to search the corridors of the asteroid for him. So, with Doc and Lemmy, he set out. They wandered through miles of passageways without seeing anybody and then heard the voice of Mitch telling them that with the aid of the vision phone, he could not only speak to Jet and his companions, but could now see them too. Telling Mitch to keep tuned in to the search party, Jet, Doc and Lemmy continued their walk along the winding corridors. Hey, listen. That's a new noise, isn't it? Now, what does that mean? Uh, where's it coming from? Well, I'd say from further along the corridor, around the corner. Come on, and take it easy. Go, go back. back. Eh? Somebody said, go back. It is forbidden to come any further. Sounds like... like a, a woman's voice. No crew personnel are allowed in this section. Go back immediately. A woman? Oh, oh no! What do you mean, oh, no? Don't you remember? Paddy told us he didn't know whether to call him a he or a she. Good grief, yes. The Martian. The one that's on this ship. That must be him. Go back. That's all very well, mate, but where do we go back to? No crew personnel are allowed in this section. Go back immediately. You said that before. It is forbidden to come any further. He said that before, too. Monotonous, isn't it? Hello, can you hear me? Go back. Hello, who are you? It is forbidden to come any further. I think the idea is that we should turn back. Well, I'm not turning back. Eh? There's nothing in sight. I don't see anybody. Why should we turn back? Hello, Mitch. Mitch, can you hear us? No crew personnel are allowed in this section. Hello, Doc. Go back immediately. Mitch, do you hear that voice? Yes, of course, Doc. And you can see us? Yeah, Jet, sure we can. Can that vision phone go on ahead of us? Well, I, I should think so. We've been following you easily enough for the last ten minutes. How far ahead are you? About thirty yards. Then keep that distance. We'll move on. If you see anything that might mean danger, let us know before we reach it. No crew personnel are allowed in this section. Go back immediately. Come on, Doc. And you, Lemmy. Now, wait a minute, Jet. Come on, and don't argue. Hello, Mitch. Hello, Jed. It's still clear ahead. 
Not that we can see very far with the corridor curving round the way it does. That's strange. What was all the fuss about then? Ah, goodness knows. But it must have meant something. Well, we haven't heard that voice for some minutes now. He must be getting ready to do us, that's why. Attention. Oh, blimey. Hold it. You have ignored the order not to proceed. Well, what are you going to do about it? Personnel proceeding beyond this point do so at their own peril. Your cheerful character, isn't it? That sounds like a flooded carburetor. What have you done to it? The car stalled. Would you like to get out and diagnose the trouble yourself? You'd like that, wouldn't you? You go ahead and fix it, and I'm warning you. If you take too long... I won't, I assure you. Why don't we get some word, Sergeant? Well, we've done everything we can, Mr. Whitman. Something should come in. Well, that's the toughest thing about this business. I'm waiting. I know. They must have taken Connor along as cover. If they did, Connor's driving the car. We put all that in the alarm. Is there any more background on the Dixon family? Any place he'd be likely to go to? Mm, I'm having that checked now. In the meantime, the clock is running out. They're running out fast. I'll get it. Police headquarters, Sergeant Gillen speaking. Yes? Yes? Where was this? Just a minute, Mr. Whitman. Yes. This is state police. They got something on Connor. Uh, let me talk to them, please. Sure, here you are. Hello? This is Special, Special Agent Whitman speaking. What have you got? I see. Uh, will you read it, please? Yes? Thank you very much. Goodbye. Come on, Sergeant. We've got a definite lead on Connor. I just hope we're not too late. Where did my sister go, Connor? Into the houseboat. Oh. Well, I guess you've got Muncie's body weighted sufficiently now. Enough to keep it from drifting. That'll make it easier for us to locate. Us? Mm-hmm. I admire your optimism. Now, if you will just drag the body out onto the deck. There, that will do nicely. And now I'll ask you to hoist it over the side. You're really running up a big score, Dixon. Just remember this gun. Go ahead, Connor. Okay. And now I suggest that we return to the cabin. Go ahead. After you, Mr. Connor. Thanks. Annette. Annette, will you stop that crying? Leave her alone. Well, Sir Galahad. Will you have a drink? No, thanks. Then I guess we'd better pass on to the next item on the program. That turns out to be you, Mr. Connor. Oh, oh you can't. Hold it, miss. Dixon. Yes, that's right, right. right. And it's been rather unbalanced in my favor, wouldn't you say? No, I wouldn't. What do you mean? You had that pistol on me all evening. But it didn't keep me from working. Working? You didn't see me drop my wallet on the floor of your sister's apartment back in Dayton, did you? Now, don't pull I that. I saw it. What? Annette, why didn't you... I left it there because I knew my partner would find it very shortly and know something was wrong. Look, Connor... I'm just trying to get my wits on the record. Very well. And you were right in suspecting I caused the car trouble back on the highway. All you gained was time, if you did. No. I left a note under a tool when I was under the car. It must have been picked up by now. And what did the note say? That we were coming here. Well, that makes you almost even. I'd say that puts me a little bit ahead. Annette, I think we're getting out of here. I hate to keep piling up points, Dixon, but... The keys to the car are in the river with Muncie's body. Why, you... Now, don't be a bad loser, Dixon. I haven't lost. Oh, no? Look at that car coming along the riverbank. Where? Uh... Oh, thank heaven. Is it the police? It isn't even a car. That was an old trick, Miss Dixon. But I won the match. <laughs> Dixon was returned to the penitentiary and subsequently tried and convicted for the murder of his fellow convict. Like all criminals, Dixon had an inflated estimation of his own ability to beat the law. 
And this was one of the most effective contributing factors to his inevitable downfall. No one is smarter than the law. Sooner or later, this inescapable fact is known to all criminals. You'll hear about next week's case in just a moment. This week, at the Equitable Society, I was shown three checks that were ready to go out in the afternoon mail. One was the biggest check I've ever seen in my life. A six, followed by six zeros. A six million dollar investment of Equitable Society funds in a great industrial concern which will employ several thousand men, many of them returning servicemen. The second check was for $16,000, a loan to a farmer in Iowa who came to his equitable society so that he could buy a piece of land he's had his eye on for many years. The third check was for $6,000, and it was going to help an ex-sergeant of the Marines buy that little house he dreamed about while he lay in a hospital recovering from wounds received on Guadalcanal. Now he's going to own that little home with the aid of the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. And there you have three of the principal ways in which Equitable Society dollars are put to work. In promoting home ownership. In lending farmers a helping hand. In keeping the wheels of industry turning. And that's why we think this life insurance business we're in is a good business. We collect premium dollars from our members for their good and then invest them in ways that are good for the entire nation. Yes, this week and every week for 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security for you, your home, and your country. Next Friday, December 7th, is the fourth anniversary of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Our program that evening will present a thrilling and factual account of the FBI's work on that momentous day. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Programs in this series of particular interest to servicemen and women are broadcast overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.